you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with us to Hosea chapter 13. We're going to look there at the first three verses. Hosea chapter 13 is in the Old Testament. It's, uh, as we're turning to those verses, uh, uh, do a little something different this morning. I want to invite everyone who's not here in person to come uh, to join us at Forest Heights Baptist Church here in uh, Fort Walton Beach, Florida at 11 o'clock. We uh, endeavor to start our service, so come on out and join us and and uh, and uh, be a part of the uh, the live uh, service here. And but we do thank you for joining us uh, on the video and uh, appreciate those of you who are and and. Uh, and uh, keep on uh, subscribe, hit the buttons. Uh, I don't know what they do. I don't think it costs anything, pretty sure about that, but it might help other people find us a little easier. So with that being said, if you have your Bible and you're at Hosea chapter 13, verse one, let me read the first three verses there in Hosea 13. When Ephraim spoke, people trembled. He was exalted in Israel, but he became guilty of Baal worship and died. Now they send them uh, more and more. Now they send more and more, and they make idols for themselves from their silver, cleverly fashioned images. All of them work the work of craftsmen. It is said of these people, they offer human sacrifices. They kiff, kiss calf idols. Therefore, they will be like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears, like chaff swirling from a threshing floor, and like smoke escaping through a window. I was reading this morning from the NIV uh, and New International Version, so I'm sure you can follow along as we continue our way through Hosea. Uh, under the title this morning is a general idea, just kind of keep a focus point under priorities. A group of friends were out deer hunting, of course some of you do and may understand this even better than others, and they separated into pairs and the right that night one hunter returned alone staggering under an eight point buck. The other hunters asked, where's Harry? The lone hunter replied, Harry fainted a couple of miles back up the trail. The others uh, couldn't believe it. You mean you left him lying there and carried the deer back instead? And the man answered, it was a tough call, but I figured no one was going to steal Harry. <laughs> Clearly a matter of priorities, right? <laughs> Sometimes the secrets of success in life are always found in our priorities. And clearly, if you get the humor there, uh, we back to Hosea here. Hosea is clearly, if you've been following along with us in this, uh, has said over and over again uh, that the people, his people, the people of Israel, the northern kingdom primarily, but it includes in, uh, the whole group, they have not um, they have not got their priorities right and uh, uh, Jose is saying that this is the problem they've gotten their priorities out of order and I want to look at that this morning in these three verses uh, to kind of help us uh, uh, mine some jewels from God's Word that we can put into our life and maybe rethink some things so um, what are the right priorities well there's a whole lot of things I suppose but Certainly the first uh, thing that we need to do is realize why we are created, why are we here? And that's a universal question people ask a lot. But the first priority is to trust God. All priorities must stop, start somewhere. And usually our first priority is always the most important one. And the Bible's clear that we were created to trust God, to follow God, to serve him and and serving him is not some onerous, uh, burdensome thing. If you look at, uh, at verse 1, just to kind of relate it to what Hosea is saying here, he says, Ephraim, that's the northern kingdom, his people, uh, they trembled. When, they, when he, Ephraim spoke, they trembled. What does that mean? What is that talking about? Well, what he's expressing there, there was a time when the people of God who trusted and followed God, when that happened, they, they, they exercise a certain respect, a certain amount of, of uh, uh, recognition among the people that such that people that around them, people that looked at them uh, said, we need to pay attention to what they're doing because that idea of trembling is an idea of humility before God is also an idea of, of reverence to God, the fear of God, this awe of God. So remember, God called a people out 
He called them his people. He called them out. He, get, he set them free, in other words, from a, 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 their slaveholders to Egypt where they would have never been able to free themselves. And he gave them uh, help all along the way, promised them a place that they could be their own, where they could then be this city on a hill, if you will, literally and, and figuratively in the sense that, that they could be a people that other people would look to and say, how did they get here? They shouldn't be by logic and reason and all kind of other look uh, man type ways of looking at it. They shouldn't be there. They shouldn't be these people. And uh, they, then they would say, we need to go find out how they got successful. How did they get this way? And they were then to tell people that it was our God, not us. This is expressed throughout the Old Testament. And certainly in the beginning of this rising of these people, the calling of the people out. And even before they crossed into the promised land, that's what we find in Deuteronomy, this giving of the law the second time. The idea that they were even warned, as we've noted before in Deuteronomy and other places, that they should remember that when they find this themselves successful, that they need not uh, forget how they got that way. Two reasons. One, that was their purpose, to be uh, noticed for their success so people would say, how is it that you managed to do this? And then they would say, our God. And two, whenever you don't recognize the real source of your strength, you become arrogant, egotistical, and you become uh, drunk with your own self. And you think that you really caught something that you didn't. And then what happens is that something that you couldn't get cannot be held on to. And so therefore, we see these things happening to, to them. Uh, <clears throat> you have to trust God. Jesus said in John 14, 1, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus says, listen, if you believe in God, they express, uh, the, his disciples and those around him expressed a certain connection with God. They, they certainly wanted to believe in God. They were there because they believe in God. He says, listen, you need to believe in me. Because we are one. We're the same. We're one. And this is where we are today. People need something to believe in that will that can stand up to time. The test of time. And the test. What we put our trust in is what we're willing to commit ourselves to. And what happened to these people, he says, if you look a little further, well, he says, uh, they trembled and they were exalted, but notice that word, but there in the very first verse, but what's that mean? Well, something happened. They changed, something changed. He says they became guilty of Baal worship and died. What does that mean? Well, they, they were, they stopped trusting God 100%. They stopped seeing God as the author of their freedom, their success and their future. And they looked at the gods of the people around them. And when they did, and they started trying to follow after them. Now, listen, I've said this many times during this series on Hosea, and I'll say it many other times because it is a universal problem and a persistent problem is that today, as same as then, what there is this strong desire, this strong effort, and, and it's very successful, and unfortunately, in people's life, is to integrate the worship of the, of the world and the things of the world into the worship with God. We try to find some way to mix them together so that we can have a foot in each one. And God is a jealous God and he tolerates none of that. And we do that by cause we, when, when the church, when the body of believers acquiesces, gives in, caves in and accepts the cultural norms, whatever time in history you want to go look at. And again, this is Requires a little bit of research. You may have to go back and look. I know that we all thought we were all born yesterday and nothing happened before we were born, but there was life and people went on and things happened and they had different cultures. We live in a, our culture is a little different than it was before and so on and so forth. And what, when, when you try, the church tries to accommodate the culture. The church exists in the world and it's supposed to. However, the church is to be the city on the hill. The church is to be different. We're not to show how successful we are by accommodating the worldliness, but by following God and allowing him to express himself through us. Not to go out here and see how many things that we can find that the world loves 
and mix it in with what we're doing so that we can say, see it. And what happens is the world says, well, see, you work just like a corporation. You work just like a big business. You, you, you know, you have customers and you, and the customers want this, you give it to them. doesn't matter if that's what you should be doing or not. You acquiesce to the customers because the customer says, we won't come. We won't participate. We won't worship. We don't want to do this. We don't want to do that. And we get fearful. Well, we won't be able to, to have this big band. We won't be able to have this big building. We won't be able to have this, uh, this, that, or the other. And so therefore we need these people. And what we forgot is, yes, we do. That's what we're here for is to reach out to people. But the thing of it is, if we allow ourselves to become uh, responding to their, to their perceived way of doing things, their way of doing things to accommodate them, then, then we've taken God out of first place and we've acquiesced to people. We said, well, we don't believe God that we can win anybody by following you. We don't believe God that we can have anybody. We can have a church or we can have this or that. And God says, you're not trusting me. So we got to trust God. What happens to us is like what happened to uh, this guy a long time ago. It's been a long time ago because I'm looking at the date here thinking, wow, it's a long time ago. Uh, 1958. Uh, some of you watching may not remember that because you weren't around. Uh, I, I, I can't say that I remember it, although I was two. Anyway, America's first commercial jet air uh, service began with a flight of the Boeing 707. Uh, people have been flying, but they had not flown on a commercial jet. A uh, month after that flight, a traveler on a piston-driven uh, plane, uh, a DC-6, uh, struck up a conversation with another passenger. And just so happens the passenger was a Boeing engineer who he struck up a conversation with. So the traveler was talking to the engineer about jet aircraft and all that kind of stuff. And the engineer was extremely enthusiastic, extremely excited about it, was talking all about it. It was such a great idea. They've been talking for a long time. And all this kind of stuff. He went through the whole list of what Boeing had done with the B-17 and B-52. For you people who don't know nothing about airplanes, don't worry about it. It was cool stuff. Uh, I'm, I have to be careful that I don't get to chasing that because I like that kind of stuff. And he says, and he asked his traveling companion if he had ever yet flown on this new 707. And the engineer replied back to him, I think I'll wait till it's been in service a while. <laughs> and, th and this is so true. We, we, we're, you know, there's so many people who call themselves Christians who are so enthusiastic about our church has a great band, our church has a great this, our church does this, our church does this, our church is this. Our ch they talk about it a lot, but they don't really put their trust in it. They're not willing to follow their God. They have replaced God very subtly. And I risk the here of, of hurting somebody's feelings, but they sometimes we put, we replace God with the things of the church. The business of the church, the the uh, the accoutrements, if you will, the out surroundings, and we when we start talking about the church, the people, we start talking about all that instead of the God that is the author and the finisher of this. The reason there is such a thing, a church is a it, to use a big word, a ecclesia, a ecclesia. The ecclesia, according to the Greek, that Greek word is the church. The church is not anything but a body of believers. It's hinged upon the fact. That it is believers in what? In accoutrements and surroundings and music and this. These are all wonderful things. Nothing is wrong with this stuff. However, when we have put the priority in the wrong place and it gets ahead of God, God is not happy. We worship what gives us security. That might be worth taking a look at. What is, gives us security? What do you ask most people what gives them security? Other people. We are great where we, we, we've got the military and all that cool stuff. We got our things, our locks, our security, our phones, our, our this, our that, all the stuff that gives us security. Our 401, our 403, our IRA, our military retirement, our civilian retirement, our this, our that. These are all securities. And we trust them and we count on them. That's where our trust. And there's a danger. I'm not saying they're bad. They're, that's not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible says is when you take the things that God has given and created and you let them get to be greater than the creator, when the creation becomes greater than the creator, you have got your life out of priority. What does that say? What is going on here? Look what it says. If you go back with me again, back to the Bible. Let's go back there. Verse 2, 
They sin more and more. They make, notice what he says, they make, not create, they make idols for themselves from their silver. Cleverly fashioned images, all of them the work of craftsmen. He says they worship the Baal. Back then, the Baal gods were the gods of the people of Canaan where they had been given this land and they came in there and they had their gods. They had their Easter bunny, their Christmas trees, their Santa Clauses. They had their this, their that. They had their 401s. They had all these things that I mentioned and all many other, any other thing you can think of. And they had all this stuff. And what did they worship? They became worshipers of that. Because that was something that the people around them worshipped and people liked that. And they said, well, there must be some power and there must be some reason for their doing it. So they took that and they mixed it in. He says they gave their sacrifices of their material possessions. They took to these false gods and laid them down before them and said, here, here. And then they took some down to the temple too. And matter of fact, it got to the point where the, the priests at the temple basically acquiesced just like the modern 20, 20th and 21st century church has done and over history many other times. It's not new. It's not, a, it's not a new thing. Okay. They took that stuff and they tried to mix it together. The things that we in the church sometimes have wrapped ourselves around and come conflated with something God wants. And then, listen, we got some great spinners. What does that mean? We got people who are really good at spinning this false worship of false things into something good. We're going to take some fake false God, some pagan God, and we're going to spin it around so that we can say that, see, this is why we do this. It takes 30 minutes to explain how a Christmas tree represents Jesus. It takes 30 minutes to explain how come a candy cane is red and white because it shows the blood of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. The next time you find a 10 year old, a 13 year old, hey, next time you find a 30 year old, ask them what that has to do with Jesus. Ask them to explain to you what. Ask some kid who comes for the Easter bunny and the, and the, and the cool clothes and the chocolate candy to see what that means about Jesus. Do that. Why are you doing this? Don't give them the Jesus thing. Let them ask, tell you what they think that's about. Why are we doing this? What's this all about? What do you like most about it? We allow churches and we allow ourselves. I, I don't mean to offend people, but listen, I don't know. I guess, I mean, I heard all the spin from, there are better spinners, the way better spinners than me. That's why I don't even do it because I can't spin it. My head won't let me, God, whatever. I don't know, but I can't get it to spin. I, I just... Just reject. I've heard some good spin on Halloween. Where, you know, we're going to meet them where they are and leave them there. That's what I say. That's what you do. You leave them there. Nobody ever remembers. Nobody spit. It doesn't get, there's no way. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. And I tell them, listen, you can go out in the street and find out what people think about this stuff. Well, now, I want to go one more step further and down there, and it says that in verse 3, or verse 2, I'm sorry, they offer human sacrifice. We're going to get back to that. And they kiss the calf idol. What does that mean? The idol of the veils was a calf, a, a bull. Remember that from the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston? But anyway, uh, remember the bull, the calf, the bull? They, this was one of their idols. God says, don't worry, don't quit doing that. Quit making stuff like that and worshiping about. Now, listen, I, I want to say this, and I'm going to leave it kind of light here for you. When it says they kissed the calf idol, I want to point out to you something. That was a nice way of saying something. It is uh, historically accurate to say that in the effort to worship the Baal God, the calf God, that they simulated copulation. If you don't know what that is, look it up. The rest of you, just take a guess. In the worship of Baal gods, we know that there was temple prostitution. That might give you a clue. So kissing the calf god is a real nice way of saying something that you would just pass out over thinking about. That was the, that's how far they got into showing their devotion to this god. Well, I'll go on. The other priority, if we first priority is to trust God, and it is, not if, but that's what it is. It, it is to trust God. What's the second priority? To love people. To love people. 
We need to love people. When we trust God, God says, love people, love your neighbor. One of the two great commandments, love God and love your neighbor, right? And uh, we have to trust people. We have to trust people. I want to read this illustration that I found that uh, I thought was pretty expressive in a sense, in a way. And it gives us, it, it's going to challenge us all, I think, to love people. It's a hard thing to do. People are ugly. We're ugly. We do some bad stuff. But we need to love people. Look at verse 2 again. What was one of the crimes of, the, of these so-called worshipers of Yahweh? They had human sacrifices. That ain't what he means by loving people. Killing people uh, for human sacrifices to worship some worldly god is not, is not the uh, uh, call for. And here in the world today, in America, and all over the world, there's legalized abortion, all that kind of stuff. We're killing people in some worship of ourself. You say, wait, well, we don't have no bell god, but we have a person, a self god. Not what I really wanted, it didn't work out for me, it wasn't, you know, I can't. You know what the problem is? When we don't see God, we don't have a God perspective. When you don't have God, you don't have God's perspective. What does that mean? You see, God is up there and he sees all this. And his definition of him is that he knows everything. He knows exactly what happened. He knows how that happened. He knows who that person's going to be. The Bible says before the foundation of the world, he knows all about this. And therefore, whatever be caused this to happen, he knows. And he wants it to go forward as it is for his purposes. And we get to thinking we know what uh, how this happened, and we want to change the outcome. We don't like the way it's going to turn out. They want they tell us it's going to, the child's going to be this or that, so we don't want that because we think we can't handle that. We think we don't know what we're going to do about that. We don't know how to handle that. We don't know what to do about that. And God says, "Why wouldn't you ask me what I thought about? It? Don't you think I can't make that work for you? You don't think I can't bring some glory out of this to myself? Can show you how something's done? You can see something beyond your own imagination." We're so arrogant that we think we know everything. That somehow we know why everything is and therefore that makes us special and we can then we can decide who and what and where. Well, anyway, there was this article in the Reader's Digest. That's, they still make those, by the way. We have some. Years ago, a, a young woman named Elsa and uh, she uh, re uh, no longer remembers what the argument was about, but she was having an argument with her husband at breakfast one morning, and she continued, uh, was her husband's name was Steve, to have this argument as she started off to work. And she said to him, how can you just go off like that? We haven't even settled this. And then Steve did something that's rare in that day and rare even more today. Steve did what few men would do, or anyone else for that matter. He was ambitious. He was driven. He was work-oriented. He was successful. He turned around. He went over to the phone. In other words, he reached in his pocket and pulled out his iPhone. He called into work, and he said, cancel my meetings and my appointments. I'll be staying home. And he stayed home. And what did he say to Elsa? Well, I don't know what they talked about, how they got that worked out, but I'll tell you what he did. He didn't say with his words that he said with his actions. He said, my relationship with you, Elsa, is way more important than all that stuff down there. Elsa discovered that she had married somebody that was different, that was willing to sacrifice their work, their success, their image, their whatever, for the person that he committed his life to. That he said those words that... We should be saying for sickness and in health and all that other. He spoke with his actions. And people today tell me, oh, I'm a Christian, Robbie. I, I'm a member of this church. And I say to them, and dangerously so, when were you there last? Well, well, I don't really have to go down there, you know. I don't this and I don't that and you know, and it's uh, everybody's got their own way and I worship this way and that way. And, you know, I caught this big fish that was a gift from God because I was fishing on, you know, when I should have been in church or I don't know, you know, stuff. You've all heard it, plenty of that stuff. 
And God stands at the door going, we haven't settled this yet. We haven't got this worked out. You don't really know what I want because you're not really asking me because you're afraid to find out. You don't really want to hear what because you're afraid to find out I'm going to ask you to do something that, well, your small mind and your world of science and your genius and your expertise and all your analysis and all that will not just be able to calculate. And so you're afraid. You don't want to know the truth, as Jack Nicholson said. You can't handle the truth. People, we got to love people. And we got to let God help show us how to do that. And we know how to do it. You know, if you know God, you know what needs to be done. You will trust that God will work it out. That's a lot. That goes back to the first one, right? If you don't trust God, then there is no way. You don't know what I have to do. Loving people. Loving people. It's something that we all have to have a new, fresh look at, right? We need to stop and reassess. God has a way of doing that. All of us have those moments. Sometimes it happens when somebody dies. Sometimes it happens when somebody's born. Sometimes it happens when people get married. Sometimes it happens when people move away. All those are times of joy and sadness and emotional response. Family had a teenage son who was involved in an accident while snow skiing. Apparently he had lost control on the slope and hit his head on a boulder, causing severe brain damage. He was in a coma for three months. One day while tra traveling with his father to the hospital to visit his son, uh, his father said to the traveling person along with him, he said, he said, you spend your life advancing your work, your career, making a decent salary to do the kinds of things that will make your life secure. And then suddenly you're reminded that the most important thing in life are the people in your life. Suddenly we're reminded that the most important thing is the people in our life. God says, if you trust me, you'll be able to love people. You'll be able to make that right decision. You know, some of the hardest decisions I have to make and I have made and I will have to make is about this or that, <laughs> right? What are we going to do? This or that? A person or something else? Me or them? What is that? That's loving people. That's a challenge. The Bible is full of it. We studied about that this morning in Sunday school. When Jesus asked Peter after his failure at, the, at Caiaphas' house and Jesus is on the shore there at the beach, he must have been in Fort Walton making something to eat. And there they were out there fishing in the Gulf, right? And Jesus asked Peter the most simple question. I can't help but steal that. Do you love me more than thee? And after Peter had struggled with that, making that answer, answering that question, it's got to be a hard question to answer. And we sometimes say, well, yeah, I got that all figured out. But sometimes our actions don't speak louder than our words, right? Remember Steve and Elsa. And so we had to answer that question. But you know what the answer really is, what Jesus really says? What, this is the part that's the hardest. That's a hard question. That's no question about that. But there's one more question, one more thing after that that's not a question but a statement. After he answers back, yes, yes, I do love you more than these. You know what Jesus said to him? Follow me. You know how that works? Think about this. When you're following somebody, you ain't in front of them. You're behind them. You're following along. Where are they going to go? I don't know. What are they going to do when they get there? I'm not sure. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? All the questions that come when you follow somebody that you don't really know all these answers to. That's trusting God and loving people along the way. You love Jesus, you'll be able to love people. There are some unlovely ones of us that need some love. They need, to, they need to know. We need to be not afraid of that, but we need to recognize that, well, there's another thing, another priority. We need to learn how to use the things in life. We need to trust God. Love people and learn how to use things. Now, remember this. God created Adam and Eve because he wanted to. 
Because he loved them. He wanted, to do, he wanted a relationship with them. And he gave them stuff and stuff to do. And he apparently gave them what they needed to manage that stuff because he said, you're going to be in charge of doing all this. Notice there was God. I made you. So you need to keep track of me and what I want. And here is some stuff to do. And Adam, you know, not to make too light of this, Adam went, wait a minute, wait, there's something missing here. <laughs> and God said, okay, here's E. <laughs> Here's the people to love. And here's some stuff for you guys to be in charge of. And so guess what? It was God. It was people. It was the stuff. God made all of it. He created us. To, that He put it in the right place. The priority is God, people, stuff, things. In other words, in verse 2, when I go back there and call your attention back to that. They took more sin and more. What did he, how did Hosea summarize all this sin? They took all the stuff and they made it into gods. <laughs> wow. They took all this stuff and they made it into gods. They chopped trees and they built houses. They shaped metal and they made cars. They mine ore and they fashioned weapons. They split atoms and they create well bombs. We, make our, we place our priority in all these things that we made rather than our maker. And we glibly speak of our love of our possessions if they were animate and able to satisfy our deepest need. I think you will find that all the money in the world, all the stuff in the world will not make you live one day longer than God intends. We are always caught by surprise by those people who seem to leave us too soon. By people who have enormous wealth and yet somehow or other they're not happy with that. We have, we're caught by all of this stuff. We're caught up in this. If I could just this and if I could just that and we if ourselves to death. And the devil laughs, laughs, laughs. And we ask people, how you doing? Oh, I've been, what's it? I've been busy. Listen, I'm preaching a sermon to myself here, folks. I understand this, Okay. Busy, busy, busy. Not the first time I've used it, but and I didn't invent it, but burdened under Satan's yoke. B-U-S-Y. Busy. It's our favorite answer when we don't really like the other answers that come to us. Just didn't want to. <laughs> didn't feel like it. Too terribly busy taking care of this, my stuff. Well, if you don't believe that you have a lot of stuff, let me give you an example that will resonate with you a little bit. At the beginning of the 20th century, way before I was here, we had the average American had 72 wants. And they thought that 18 of those 72 were absolutely essential. It's 72 wants at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay. At the end of the 20th century, the average American had 496 wants, and 96 of those were deemed to be absolutely essential, a six times multiplication. In 100 years, the average American had six times more wants and six times more essential needs, if you will, basically. And I dare say, the way things move in exponential fashion, that in 20 years of the 21st century, we have multiplied that by many others. You all may remember Irma Bombeck. She was a columnist who wrote some funny stuff and had a funny outlook on life. She had cancer. And one of the things that gave her strength, she said in one of her books, was that she went to uh, <clears throat> a place where the children had cancer and she was there encountering these little children who had cancer and listening to what they had to say. And she said that one little voice that constantly echoed in her mind and her heart was that of an eight-year-old girl named Christina. Christina had cancer of the nervous system. And on her eighth birthday, she was in the hospital with this cancer. And, and Irma was there trying to probably help them uh, see what she could do for them and draw some attention to that. And she asked uh, this little girl, Christina, uh, on her eighth birthday what she wanted. What do you want, Christina, on your eighth birthday? And Christina thought for a long time. Finally, she said, you know, I don't know. 
I have two sticker books and a cabbage patch doll. I have everything. Things, things. How many times could you say, I have everything? When you have everything, you got a lot of time left over for people. <laughs> when you have everything, you got a God you can thank. When you thank him enough, the next thing you know, you start trusting him. You start seeing how he had his hand in this stuff and how that matters. And what you don't have don't matter. And what you don't have that you think you really need, God might give it to you. You see, there are rich people and poor people in the Bible. They all needed God. God knew that. God took care of them, the ones that trusted him. And the ones that were enormously rich that didn't trust God suffered because their riches would not work. Read uh, read Solomon, Solomon's writings in Ecclesiastes. It's a, it's a whole thing of how disappointed he is and what all he figured out in his infinite wisdom. The wisest man in the world besides Jesus. The wisest man who had everything, basically, that anyone could imagine. And how disappointed it was and all that stuff that didn't really count. So I want to ask you a question this morning as we close. What are you leaving that will last for eternity? What kind of stuff do you have that will last forever and forever and forever? Whatever you answer are your priorities and do your priorities shout that louder than your words? I think we could all fall down on our knees, put our hands in our face, and feel woefully short that our priorities scream what we want what we have that will last for eternity. I will give you an answer that will cover all of that. Only what's trusted to God. Only what's trusted in God. Only what you give to God will last for eternity. What does that mean? If you have given your life to God and if you have fallen into that place where you can honestly say when God says follow me, you're following him. He's in front of you. He's ahead of you in every area and every aspect. Have you given your life to God? Have you trusted him with your eternity? People trust God, eternity to science, to, uh, to uh, a freedom, to politics, to the doctors, to the weapons, to all kind of stuff. We trust all this stuff. And, and, and all of that is stuff, and it has a place. Understand, I said God created stuff. But he wants us to trust him first so we know how to handle the stuff. Otherwise, the stuff owns us. And that's not right. The priority is wrong. I hope you will or have trusted your future to Jesus. Jesus says, you believe in God, you believe in me also. Remember that? Jesus said in that chapter, John chapter 14, that verse first where I read that he said, you believe in God, you believe in me. I don't know how many people I've heard say they believe in God, but they don't really want to have nothing to do with Jesus. Or they don't really believe everything God says. So they don't really believe in God as in a relationship. They don't trust God. They're just trying to fill a space. They're just trying to check a box. They're trying to add a little parachute to their thing, a little extra insurance policy to their system just so they can say they did. And they, by saying something like that so glibly and so, so kind of shallow, superficially, you know what they've done? If God is who he says he is, they have stood, they have they have said, you're not that smart, God. You will be tricked by the fact that I said I believed in you when I really didn't. You'll be fooled by the fact that I have my name on a church roll somewhere. And therefore, I must be one of yours because I wrote my name down. I sent them a letter. I brought them some money. I said amen a couple of times. I agreed with something they said once or twice. But I got no time for that. I'm too busy taking care of the priorities, Mom, because I don't really trust that you've got my best interest at heart. That somehow or other I'll be able to leave. You know what most people seem to, uh, seem to have to say one way or the other if they don't use the words? They want to be remembered. They want to be remembered. I don't know about you, but that's a scary thing. I'm a little more cautious about that. You know why? Because I, I can go back in history and read about some people that is remembered that's really bad that didn't live up to things, that served as a great bad example, if that's what you want to be remembered for. Or the danger of just becoming nothing. 
Nobody really remembers. You know why people put markers on graves? So they can remember. Now, I'm not criticizing anybody, so hear me well. I am not criticizing anybody, but really, if that person left that kind of impression on your life, do you really need that? I mean, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying think about that. Do you know that nobody knows where Jesus was buried? Do you know that they, oh, they got places, they say this was that and that. And Jesus would be, he, you know what I think Jesus thinks about all that? What a waste of time and energy. If I wanted you to know where I was buried, I would have put the spot. You would have never been able to figure it, find, uh, to uh, forgot about it. You know what he said? You know why I think that? What the hell about Moses, the greatest person in the history of Israel, according to them, Moses. God said, I don't want nobody to know where you're buried. Because they'll all be down there. And there'll be a fight over who said it was the best place and it was here or it was there. But does anybody forget about Moses? No, you know why? Because God won't let you. God don't want him to forget about it. He keeps it reminded. All the books in the world and all the history of the world gets, disappears and goes off and loses it. We can't find it. and it's, It has hardly very few pieces of it. But yet the word of God has stood since the beginning of time. Since God issued those words and gave Moses the effort to write them down, the power to write them down, have we got it still. And it still persists. When people who hated the Bible and was going to destroy it, got rid, said they were going to outlast the Bible and all this, they aren't. They're all just dust in a grave somewhere. And you know what? The only reason I remember some of them is because they said they were, going to, they were going to get rid of God. They were going to get God eliminated. That's a bad, that's a bad example. Have you trusted yourself to Jesus? He's the way, he said, and the truth and the life. And no one comes to God the Father without it coming through him. No one. You can't spend, you can spend that all you want. It ain't going nowhere. Have you done that this morning? If you have, what's your priorities? How are you doing on that? Listen, don't be disheartened. Do you like Peter? Hitch up your drawers and get busy. Fix it. Do it. Right? Jesus was still there. He wanted to help Peter do it. If he wanted to help Peter work it out, he'll help you. Trust God. Love people. Use things. Would you pray with me, Heavenly Father, this morning? We thank you. We thank you that we are able to be here this morning to be challenged by your word, to, to have an opportunity to realign our priorities. Lord, I know Peter was thankful that you asked him those three hard those questions three times i know lord that he was glad to be able to get back in business with you i pray father that we're equally as glad to follow you that our words and our lives and our priorities will line up with what we say we believe with a god who's first who knows all things that we can trust always has our best interests at heart always knows what he wants us to do always has purposes for us and plans for us and ways to make things happen that's beyond our imagination beyond our understanding i'm glad to have that kind of god i pray this morning father that other people will be glad too and will be willing to sacrifice their own selfish ways their own ideas and thoughts for that lord to come unto you and humbly say to you lord i i'm just i'm a real smart guy but i don't really know all this stuff i'm not really sure how to do that but I'm going to trust you. I pray that this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name.